We'll share screen too while you're at it. And how do I just how do I enable it for do I do I have to make you a host? No, just go down to where it says multiple participants. Okay, hold on. I oh, it's got all crazy. Yeah, I got moved around here. Let's see what's going on here. Oh, because I got share screen. That's what happened. Did I stop share? Okay. <laughs> I don't know what happened. So wait, how do I uh, enable share for everyone? That, that's one thing I'm not sure. I don't sure. know if there is. Or do I have to make you a host? Or I'm not clear how you do that. Do you know? Just go to where it says share screen on the bottom, the green right. button. Uh -huh. And then there should be something that wow. says allow multiple participants to there share screen. There you go. Screen. Okay, I clicked it. Good to go. All right, awesome. All right, so um, James, if you want to start. I'm recording. Oh, all right. Uh, I guess I'm going to take this from kind of a wide, wide angle lens, uh, starting off looking at uh, the national elections uh, and then discuss some some of the state elections here in Oklahoma as well. Uh, and I think the, the big takeaway I have from uh, this election is uh, nobody comes out a clear winner. Nobody can come out of this claiming that they've got a mandate to go in a particular direction, that uh, their particular view, public policy prescription or anything has been wholly endorsed by uh, American voters. Uh, you have, uh, I think at the end of the day, if Biden ends up winning, it looks like he, he certainly has the inside track. Uh, and to my knowledge, if, if, if anything has happened since I last looked, to my knowledge, we still have about five states that have yet to be called. Uh, and uh, we're waiting on those numbers to come in, but it looks like Biden most likely will be elected uh, president at the end of the day, although we can still say we're not entirely 100% sure of that. Uh, but so Democrats can claim, yay, we got the presidency, uh, but uh, they didn't gain, it does not look like they're going to get a majority in the Senate. Uh, they're going to fall short of that. Uh, and it looks like their House majority will shrink somewhat by about five seats. Uh, from what I've seen. Uh, so uh, that's not a clear endorsement uh, of them. If anything, this looks like uh, American voters saying, for the most part, we're kind of tired of Trump and the circus that has been the Trump administration uh, and would like to see something else go on there. But uh, uh, in, in everything else, you've got a, basically a stalemate. Uh, whoever becomes president is still gonna deal with a chamber of Congress that is entirely committed to opposing their agenda. Uh, so you're not going to see just a heck of a lot, I don't think, a heck of a lot of action one way or the other in, in that arena. Uh, and the big, for me, one of the big things is that I don't think either side has any incentive or motivation or, or, or feeling any pressure to find ways of compromising and find ways of getting things done, cooperating, backing away from the polarization or the hostility. I think all of that is still right there front and center. Uh, and is going to be there, uh, and quite frankly, regardless of who is president, it's going to be there. So nationally, that's kind of, uh, of my, my picture. Uh, I wish it was a more rosy, a more gleeful, a more joyful uh, analysis, but mm, that's not what I'm taking away from this. Mm -hmm. uh, at the state level, I would say if, if the national level elections were disappointing for Democrats, the state level elections were pretty much devastating for them. Uh, the Democrats lost five seats in the state House of Representatives. That's going to push the total, uh, you know, of 101 members. That's going to push the total of Republicans up to right around 80. Uh, and that's, you know, I don't know what Democrats are going to do. I don't know how much influence they're going to have in that body uh, for a while. Uh, the Senate held uh, basically the same. Uh, each party gained a seat and lost a seat. So uh, it's, it's the same. Uh, and Democrats lost the one seat they had in the congressional delegation with Kendra Horn uh, losing to uh, State Senator Bice uh, by about uh, 4%, I think, from about 52% uh, to 48% to in that congressional seat. Uh, I do think libertarians should be ha handing, uh, sending out thank you notes and maybe some uh, chocolates or something to the Democrats for failing to field a candidate for the Corporation Commission seat because they did so. Uh, libertarians were easily able to obtain the um, percentage of the vote they needed for a statewide office to remain on the ballot for another uh, election cycle. So uh, 
they, they should be uh, thanking the Democrats for failing to do that. That's not a positive sign for Democrats. That the, that's the third statewide seat in the last two election cycles that Democrats have failed to fill this a candidate for. Uh, and so that kind of shows the weakness uh, of, of the party to be able to field candidates across the board for those statewide offices at this point. Um, I was surprised that both state questions went down uh, in flames, <laughs> uh, not even close. Uh, I thought the uh, criminal justice one would be close, but I actually thought coming off the heels of some of the other criminal justice reform measures that had passed, I thought this one would too, but uh, voters rejected it soundly uh, as they did uh, state question 814, which uh, was going to reallocate the TSEP funding uh, from what its structure is right now. So. Uh, that's, you know, uh, I'm not sure, you know, that I saw much of anything e really on either of those two state questions. I did hear some anti-805 ads uh, late in the week leading up to uh, the election. Uh, so I think the advocates for both of those questions didn't do a great job communicating uh, what they were for, why people should be voting for them, and uh, voters at the end of the day just opted to go no uh, there. Um, in the national elections here in the state, so obviously Trump won big. I don't think that's a surprise. Uh, I think uh, Senator Inhofe's victory was a little bit larger than what a lot of people were expecting. I thought a lot of people were expecting Abby Broyles to perform a little bit better in that race. Uh, she didn't crack 33% statewide. Uh, although we will note in Oklahoma County, she got within one percentage point of Inhofe in Oklahoma County. So that kind of speaks to the changing trends that we're seeing in Oklahoma County becoming more of a purplish uh, county, if you will. Um, in the congressional districts one through four, uh, not a, no Democrat candidate for any of those seats cracked 33%. Uh, so the incumbents uh, were all reelected by very large margins. Uh, we've already mentioned uh, the horn Vice race uh, again, Horn did win Oklahoma County uh, slightly, but not by enough to offset how large of a loss she took in Pottawatomie and Seminole counties. Uh, in some state legislative races that I thought were interesting, uh, Chelsea Branham, who was a Democrat incumbent in House District 83, uh, was not able to hold that seat. I believe she was elected in 2018, so she was uh, first elected there. This was a, a seat that the Democrats picked up that I think a lot of nobody was kind of looking at, at at that time uh and uh but she was not able to hold it on as eric roberts uh defeats her uh by a, a slim margin um another democrat that i just because she represents uh Ro the area that rose state college is in uh uh kelly albright uh, also went down in defeat now this is a, a unlike uh branham's district house district 83 where the majority of registration is republican um Albright's district, the Republicans have a plurality majority or plurality of registered voters, but they don't have a majority of registered voters in House District 95. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, Max Wolfley was able to defeat her again by a fairly slim margin. So those are just some of the interesting ones uh, that I pulled out. Uh, on the whole, in the state, really, really tough night for, for Democrats. It just, uh, there's no way of sugarcoating that. It really was. Uh, but nationally, the Democrats probably are going to be saying, yay, we got the presidency. And then, oh, crap, what are we going to do now? Because there's just not if the Republicans do end up retaining the Senate, which I think it looks like they're going to, uh, you're just going to have this stalemate continue. And as I mentioned, nobody seems positioned to be able to say, how are we going to shake hands and cross the aisle and get some stuff done? Uh, you're still going to have these entrenched uh, polarized uh, attitudes that are, that are just going to stay there for a while. That's my take. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. All right. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. I appreciate it. Um, uh, Dr. Jan Hart. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to skip over some of the things that James mentioned. I just want to point out turnout. We were close to 70%. Um, as of about midday yesterday, it was at 69.25%. Uh, I also want to point out that uh, every single county, county went for Trump. Um, the closest, which was Oklahoma County. Um, I don't know if any, any of you were watching that, but it for a while we were, Oklahoma County was over the majority for Biden. 
Um, but alas, um, no surprise, um, it also went for Trump. And But it was the only county in the state which had Trump with under 50%. Um, he just talked about the House District, so I'm gonna skip that. I'm gonna point out that for all the polling mistakes, um, Oklahoma polling actually seemed to do its job uh, because the last poll that I saw had Vice up by 4% and she won by 4%, like almost exactly. So I thought that was great. Um, he mentioned the uh, House of Representative races in Oklahoma. Um, they're listed there in case you're curious um, for the five seats that flipped. Um, and yes, it was a devastating loss for Democrats. Um, we also elected the first Muslim non-binary state legislator. Uh, there was a trend across the country uh, for those in the LGBTQ community to be elected um, all in mean, num numerous states. Um, and it actually made CNN. Um, so I was a little surprised. Um, usually Oklahoma only makes CNN for bad, bad news. Um, I just think they were surprised. Uh, one of the things I keep track of is I keep track of basically Oklahoma's lack of competitiveness for, for better word for it. Um, and so I went and backed and looked at the primaries. Um, we have way too many seats where we can't even field two candidates uh, in a primary. Or we can't field two candidates in a general election. So this one looks at the house. Um, it's worth noting that only four Democrats uh, James was pointing out how bad the Democrats are. Um, only four Democrats had a primary in June. So um, yeah, really sad. Uh, and 64 without a contest in the general election for the House. Uh, for the Senate, um, as you mentioned, Democrats lost and pick up a seat or vice versa for the Republicans. Uh, thought it was also interesting that we are going to have um, siblings in the Senate, uh, if you notice the Dossett race. Um, and so one is the sister um, of the other. Um, so there's also looking at the primaries and the general elections in terms of competitiveness. Um, again, only four seats were contested. Um, so yeah, there is just too many seats where we don't have uh, two players in the ball game. And if you don't have two players in the ball game, whether it's a Republican or a Democratic primary or whether it's in the general election, um, to me, that doesn't mean that you have a choice. Um, and so a lot of times Oklahomans are stuck without a choice. Uh, I also looked at voter registration. The Oklahoma Election Board just put up its new registration statistics. Uh, and I'm comparing that to what it was in January 15th of 2020. And you can see that for the first time, Republicans, or at least in a while, Republicans are over the 50% majority mark for total voter registration. And so I went and looked at the number of counties that are plurality Democrat or the number of counties that are plurality Republican. And you can see that 76.6%, um, the largest party in that county is uh, Republican. And so what does that look like draft geographically? Um, you can see um, that, uh, yes, this is me coloring it in uh, last, late last night. Um, but as you can tell, most of the Democratic counties, the ones in blue, are in the southeast corner of the state, with the exception of what looks like Harmon, Greer, and Caddo County. Um, so that is not a surprise. We know about um, that, that southeast corner of the state has typically been Democrat. Uh, but they don't vote that way, at least in presidential elections. Um, in the past, I have done some campaign finance stuff. And so this shows you since 1998 to 2018, basically what is the average amount of money that it takes to run uh, for office in Oklahoma. You can see house races are typically 25, 35, 40,000 bucks. A Senate race typically is somewhere between 60 and 100. And some of the other races, you can see a wide amount of discrepancy uh, in terms of what it takes to run. Look at the governor's race as an example, or particularly look down at the superintendent of public instructions race, um, because there are just great variety depending upon, again, how much competition is in that race. 
Uh, this looked at the House and Senate receipt averages. In other words, how much money raised. Um, you can see that independents in Oklahoma have a really hard time that not surprisingly, Republicans basically outspend, outraise Democrats every single time. So did the winners over the losers, typically by ratio of about six to one, seven to one, depending upon when it is. Um, incumbents and challengers are the same way and open seats are somewhere in, this, in the middle. Uh, these look at what are the predominant uh, political action committees in Oklahoma. Uh, from my research, I added in Native American organizations, even though they're not technically treated as a PAC. So you have to go in by hand and search out every single one under every single state legislator to find those. Um, but they're just so important in Oklahoma, as you can see um, in 2018, they were two out of the top five. Um, and so keeping them out is a major problem. You can also see the lack of democratic uh, organiz party organizations on both of these lists, uh, which they used to be there in 2006, 2008, 2010. They're no longer there. Uh, these are the average amounts. Keep in mind, it's a $5,000 uh, max donation. So you can see here that quite a few organizations are in the $2,000, $3,000 range. Um, and you can see the Republican State House Committee or the Oklahoma Republican Party in both of those. Uh, this is the number of donations. Um, most organizations don't give a lot. Um, and so organizations that tend to give a lot tend to give very small amounts with the exception of a few um, types of uh, organizations. You can see that these organizations like United Community Bankers PAC is a good example or Oklahoma Bankers Public Affairs, Oklahoma Optometry PAC. Most of these are occupational type organizations like the Osteopaths um, and the Oklahoma Medical PAC. Uh, it's also one of the times where I'm really glad that we have um, Excel uh, because certain things I don't like to type out. Osteopath is one. Um, the PAC donations overall, again, comparing 2018 to 2012, um, you can see average donation, the number, the total, and the percentage of the total. Obviously, health, business, oil and gas, um, and Native American organizations are the key ones in Oklahoma, um, and they have been for a while. Um, with the exception of 2018, uh, Native American organizations dropped a little bit. Uh, if you look at PAC donations by party, uh, no big surprise, Republicans um, overall are getting a lot more money because they have a lot more candidates. But when you go to averages, um, there's some interesting differences, um, particularly note um, again, the, um, sorry, there's only one word for it, pitiful performance um, by our Democrats. Um, they just stink. Uh, there's no other way to describe it. Um, whether it's in terms of donations or total, particularly look at the total amounts, not the averages, because you can see for ideological packs, the Democrats spend more on average, but there was only one. So really not a whole lot of money there. Um, you can also see incumbent challenger open seat. And again, I take the, take the type of pack and spread it out by um, how much they did on average, how many donations there were and how much there was overall. I'm going quickly through this because I know I have a couple more slides. Um, these are 2020 information, um, the latest from the Oklahoma um, Campaign Finance website. And so these are your top spenders um, and top recipients of contributions. Um, so some of you might recognize some of those names, including the corporation commissioner who just won. Um, these are the top political action committees um, that uh, raise money. Uh, and you can see the Republican organizations again reflected. You can see the Association of General Contractors back, which was mentioned um, previously. Um, you can see the Democrats at the bottom, um, but again, the Republicans are um, far outspending the Democrats, um, not surprisingly. Um, and I was a little bit surprised by the Democrats, particularly considering how badly they did in November 2020 elections in Oklahoma. Again, your nurse anesthetist pack, um, your total expenditures, this is what you're looking at. And so you can see it doesn't take 
a tremendous amount of money. The, the top political action committee, a um, hundred thousand bucks. I know it's a lot to some people, but for a political action committee, that's just not that much money. Then I went into the individual races. Um, I love um, the Center for Responsive Politics site. Um, and so I looked at the Senate race and you can see clearly um, one of the factors that may have contributed to um, Inhofe's victory. If, as I was watching television, I did not see a lot of Abby Broyles ads. Um, I saw some of her signs, but not a lot of ads. Uh, this could explain part of the reason. Um, I also looked at the house races. This was pulled off, I would say about three weeks ago go just to give you an idea. Um, and what you will see across the board, except for obviously District 5, um, is that there's basically no competition when it comes to money uh, versus the incumbent. Um, 1.2 million, for example, in District 2 versus 17,000. Um, yeah, it's just um, kind of sad in terms of the competition. It gets even sadder when you look at District 4 with Tom Cole. Um, there obviously was no money competition there. And then you look at District 5 and you can see why that was the race it was. Um, one of the more expensive uh, dis uh, congressional district races in Oklahoma history, certainly. And then I went to look more at the type of contributions they were receiving. You can see that they both were receiving quite a few small contributions, which is $200 or less, but they were also both receiving a lot of large uh, contributions. Uh, Kendra Horn received more PAC contributions, not surprising for an incumbent, um, and none of them spelt, spent their own money because if you spend your own money, you're typically a loser. Uh, and then I looked at Biden versus Trump. Um, this was the latest figures that they had available. Uh, and so you can see some of the differences there in terms of the money raised and the money spent. And then I went Again, to look at the size of the contribution, because I think that's important. Notice that the large and the small individual contributions less than 200 flips um, based upon which candidate it is. Um, so notice that, that there's a difference there um, and that candidate self-financing for Donald Trump, despite his claim that he was gonna put in 100,000 or more um, was at a little over 8,000 bucks. And then that was the expenditure breakdown, I think. When it comes down to it, one of the big um, postmortems of the 2020 elections is going to be how Donald Trump spent his money. Uh, he wasted absolute tons of it, um, to be honest, on things like Super Bowl ads and on things like Pascal and his outfit. And so that will be one of the postmortems of this race. I also looked um, with some little bit of irony at the differences between the Democrats and the Republicans in terms of how much they were raising in the last quarter. Uh, apparently money in those Senate races did not make much of a difference for most cases uh, because the Democrats outspent every single Republican down the list. Um, and in the previous quarter, they outspent them nine out of 11 races. Uh, apparently it didn't make much of a difference because as you can see, most of the ones on the Democratic side were losers and that is it. Thank you, Jan. That was an incredible amount of data. Uh, uh, maybe, hopefully, we maybe can get your slides if people want them. Uh, but that was great. Um, okay, Arnold Hamilton. I don't know what I have to talk about now after these two. I mean, gee, many Christmas. I, you know, I thought I was all prepared here. Um, well, a couple of things uh, stood out to me. First of all, when you're talking about uh, the legislature. Um, the uh, um, the complete uh, demolition of, of Democrats in rural Oklahoma. Uh, well, it, it it was finally completed this this cycle. Uh, there is not a rural member of the legislature who's a Democrat uh, heading into the next session. You know, a couple of legislators gave up their seats and decided not to run again. Perryman and Chickasha and 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 uh, Ben Loring up in Miami, uh, and those seats were gobbled up quickly by Republicans. And uh, then Matt Meredith, the incumbent Democrat from Tahlequah in Cherokee County, ended up getting beat. 
Although, you know, there's a little more nuance to that race in that the uh, Republican candidate, uh, Culver, uh, his father was a longtime legislator in that area up there, and they were always big Democrats, um, but they switched parties a few years ago, and his mother in particular, I'm told, had quite a breach uh, with the uh, local Democratic Party over her son's decision to move back from the Texas Panhandle and run for that seat. So it's, it, I, I do have to laugh as I, I, I love the map, Jan, that you had of the, uh, of, uh, the uh, counties and, and voter registration in Oklahoma because it's just, it is laughable that all those blue counties are in Little Dixie in southeastern Oklahoma. And you, know, you couldn't elect a, a Democrat as a dog catcher uh, down there. There was a candidate, there was a state Senate candidate in McAllister that, I, I thought seemed to hit all the right notes. Jerry Donathan was his name, a Democrat. Um, he, he looked up, he looked to me like he had the, uh, the potential to sort of be Oklahoma's John Tester. He had the crew cut and you know, the whole bit. It was plain talking. He was, a, he was a former, he worked for the Highway Patrol. He was a former railroad guy. He was a, he was a union iron worker. I mean, he just seemed to strike all the right notes. And I think he got about 25% of the vote down there. So. You know, it just goes to show you that if you have an R behind your name in rural Oklahoma right now, um, you know, you're, you're in pretty good, you're in pretty good shape. Uh, I, I would point out, interestingly enough, that um, there were a couple of at least reasonably competitive house races in Comanche County. And uh, the Democrats down there challenging uh, two Republican incumbents, both ended up uh, well into the 40s, if I remember from my last uh, look at it. And, you know, you wonder a little bit if uh, Comanche County, you know, Lawton, Fort Sill and so forth, uh, might be trending a little bit toward the purple uh, side of things. Uh, I guess we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But there's some uh, sense that perhaps that could be could be happening uh, out there. Uh, James, I'm glad you pointed out that the difference in that fifth district race was uh, Seminole and Pottawatomie counties, because had it not been for those, uh, Horn would have been, uh, if she had uh, done better out there, she would have, have won re-election. But I think part of that had to do with the fact that with the huge turnout, uh, uh, Trump actually fared better in Oklahoma County than a lot of people thought heading in. There was some reason to believe that Oklahoma County might actually end up being a blue county and that Biden might squeak through and, and win that thing. And he did not. And I think the, the fact that uh, so many Republican voters turned out, and that's a, uh, a hat tip to the, to the ground game and the uh, increased uh, registration in the last couple of months before uh, the election, that, um, you know, I think that kept uh, um, Horn's margin from being considerably larger and maybe even bulletproof uh, in Oklahoma County. You know, one of the things that has really stood out to me and, and you know, you all may think I've lost my mind when I say this, but I, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to death that um, we had a 70 or nearly 70% or right at a 70% turnout in Oklahoma. I mean, that is just, you know, my, we are we are pathetic generally with our turnout uh, in Oklahoma, and you know it, it's a national embarrassment as far as I'm concerned. So to get to get to 70 was pretty good, except that really belies the story here, which is you know we have about one in five Oklahomans who are age eligible to vote who are not even registered. Now you know I acknowledge that there some of those. Um, you know, they, maybe there are citizenship issues there. Maybe there are um, uh, criminal uh, uh, penalties that have not been satisfied. You know, there, there are some explanations for that. But there is, there is a fair amount of uh, disconnect from the civic culture uh, out there uh, in, in Oklahoma. And if you look at, if you look at turnout, for, from the perspective, and I think this is a, a, a metric that we all have to consider, the, the perspective of total percentage of age eligible voters in Oklahoma. Even this year, we were only at 54%. And that's, you know, and now that's better than we had been. We were 42 and a half percent in 18, and we had a very competitive governor's race that year, as you recall. We were only at 51.3% in 2016. And we were a mere 40% back in 2014 when we had a governor's race. 
you know, those numbers are, are terrible. And, um, you know, that's something that we've got to figure out a way. And I, you know, this is an opportune time. There's more, there's been more energy and interest, I think, politically in this state in the last year. And it seems to me that this would be an opportune time for the legislature to take a serious look at ways that we can make voting uh, uh, more convenient, um, you know, uh, uh, less burdensome. Uh, it, however, you know, when you win under the system as it is, you're not as interested in changing the system. And Republicans obviously have the power to sit on it and not do anything at this time. But it'd be interesting to see if there will be some citizen movement to try to find ways to uh, improve, uh, you know, access to the process, whether it's a same day registration or, you know, uh, lifting the, the notary requirement on, on absentee ballots or, you know, or drop boxes around the state or, or whatever those cases might be. Because the fact of the matter is, is we don't participate very well in Oklahoma. And that's something that we need to think about because I don't think we're gonna have a healthy civic culture here until we do so. So that's, I mean, those are just a few of the things that, I mean, I could have talked about, uh, you know, the legislative breakdowns and, and that kind of thing, but you all covered that beautifully. So I think, uh, John, it would probably be better to just throw it up into questions and see if, uh, you know, if we can answer them. Well, I was going to know a couple things and, and maybe while I'm talking, people can throw up some questions. Uh, we don't have any yet, but a couple things is, you know, Jan mentioned, uh, you know, okay, turnout. Um, so I want to talk a little more about that. You, you guys, uh, between James and, and Jan and, and Arnold, you guys said some stuff I was going to say. So I'm going to focus a little more on turnout. Um, I, a couple things I thought was interesting. And Arnold said, you know, we don't participate real, really well. Well, that's very true. A um, couple things I want to note nationwide. Uh, we had about 22 million more voters overall between uh, you know this this year 2020 versus 2016. So it was higher, and that's uh, higher than we've had. Um, I think it's since uh, the early 1900s uh, in terms of uh, voting eligible population. Um, so I thought that was fascinating. But what I thought was also interesting is that early voters, there was about 100 million early voters. Uh, and in 2016, there was about, there was about 48 million early voters. Um, so that doubled. Um, so, you know, I kind of was wondering, you know, how much was this early voting a sign of a large number of increase? Uh, or was it a uh, all, you know, will it pan out on election day and be about what it was? I think there was half a difference. It's in between somehow. It's, it's, there was an increase by about 28 million nationwide. Um, and, uh, you know, 50, of, 50 million were, were early voters. So, you know, it, it's a little bit of a mix. I thought that was interesting. I looked at a stat. I was trying to uh, see how Oklahoma did um, according to, you know, you can look at raw numbers, but how do we stack up according to the states? Well, I looked at um, a place called electionproject.org. Uh, and it was interesting because it, uh, I looked at, well, wh how does Oklahoma stack up in uh, according to voting eligible population? Uh, Arnold, you know, he, he mentioned that uh, we don't turn out very well. That's very true. In the United States, our, the VEP, uh, voting eligible population, is 66.5% here in 2000, which is great. I mean, that, like I said, that's the highest we've had in, you know, 100 years. So, um, but in Oklahoma, we ranked last, 50th in the United States. Now, if you go back to the last few elections, we were probably between 45th and 48th. Uh, but in Oklahoma, strangely enough, this year, we're 55.30. Uh, that pretty much matched uh, 2004's VEP. Uh, and so I thought that was very interesting. We actually had a higher VEP in 2000 and 2008, both 55%, 55.8% VEP. So those are voting eligible population. That's not just registered. It's like those who are eligible to vote if they did register, right? So 53% is, uh, or 55.3% is what we came out this time. Um, that's actually down. Uh, it, it is higher than 2012 and 2016, but 2008 and 2000, it was uh, actually higher at that point. So we actually had a bad year in Oklahoma in terms of turnout, uh, a little higher than usual. 
uh, at least in the last few years, but you know, nothing great. And we are the last in the country in turnout. I don't know why that is. That might be something we can talk about more, why Oklahoma doesn't turn out. Uh, and we were dead last. So I, I noticed that as I was playing with the data, I was like, oh, wow, we are dead last. So that's, I think that's interesting. Um, something else here. Um, Yeah, I guess I guess that's all. Uh, that that's the main point here. You know, uh, United States, it's way up. For us, it's way down. I mean, it's up slightly for us, uh, but it's down compared to other uh, years and uh, compared to the United States. So, are there any questions? We can get into that. We had a lot of comp very comprehensive uh, talks today. So. Um, without being repetitive. Are there any questions whatsoever? I've sat on some of the um, statewide um, boards to try to increase turnout. And it is basically a slog going uphill, uh, carrying a thousand weight pound behind you. Uh, it is just almost, I mean, we tried, we tried the notary requirement. We tried to, to reduce that. Uh, to not have it at all, to try to reduce the number or to increase the number of people that could um, be notarized by a single notary. We tried trying to get college um, polling places. Um, that was basically an impossibility. So what we were told, um, we tried a number of things and pretty much we were shot down on every single thing, every single one that we tried. So uh, in terms of attempting increased turnout, um, the institutional impediments that exist are tremendous. So, so Jan, I got a question then, uh, or, and other panelists can chime in, uh, but it seems like nationwide, it seems like conservatives or Republicans tend to want to, uh, you could use the word suppress, uh, but basically put some barriers into voting. They're worried about voter fraud. Democrats are more apt to say, like, we'll have everybody vote. I think it's fascinating. We had the highest turnout we've had in a long time, and it didn't really hurt Republicans as much as you would think. You know, it, it seems like the outcome would have definitely created a wave for Democrats because the numbers are up, but it didn't necessarily do that, which tells me that you know, really pushing for uh, voters to vote really does not necessarily uh, mean a slam dunk for Democrats. Um, do you guys have any thoughts on that? And we're a real conservative state and we're, we're dead last. So it makes me wonder if that has something to do with it, but it's uh, like this overall election nationwide is not necessarily panning out that way. Well, certainly looking at the overall Democratic voter registrations, uh, that is definitely a good part of that. Uh, the fact that Republicans went over the majority for the first time, um, you know, they're, I don't know if they were ever over the majority um, in the past, they must have been, but uh, certainly now they are clearly the, in the majority at over 50%. But also I think the, I'm just gonna say it again, the lack of competition and particularly the lack of recruitment by the Democrats both in terms of money and in terms of candidates at the lower ballot races uh, clearly contributed to that. So yeah, lack of competition. So people aren't turning out because they don't see the point maybe. Yeah, I think, um, you know, nationally, when we look nationally, because I, you know, I think there was this expectation that there would be this kind of blue wave that, you know, moved the Senate into Democrat hands that, uh, there was an expectation to expand the, the Democrat majority in the House, as well as gain the presidency. And the fact that didn't materialize, even with the increase in uh, in the numbers of people voting, you know, maybe Republicans will be less hesitant to uh, resist against that going forward. I don't know. Uh, you know, you're still going to have uh, there's still a faction, a sizable faction, I would say, in the Republican Party that. Uh, prefers, you know, more restrictive measures relating to voting. But uh, I think now, you know, uh, you can kind of point and say, look, uh, there, you didn't get overwhelmed in this election because more people turned out to vote. Uh, and, and again, my reading of this, this, this election, at least nationally, is that people were just tired of the circus that has been the Trump administration more than anything else. And uh, and they wanted something else. And that's that's what, how they voted. Now, 
uh, going forward, we'll see, you know, we'll see how that may change, but at least that's, that's my reading as of right now. Well, and I, I wanted to add to what Jan was talking about. Democrats um, probably, I think, arguably have hit rock bottom uh, in Oklahoma. Maybe not. I mean, I suppose it could get worse, but uh, hard to imagine how. But, um, you know, these things, uh, there is a, uh, Democrats, because they dominated for more than a century, I think, sort of, uh, lost uh, their way uh, in, in some respects. And, and one of the major ways is they allowed their uh, bench to atrophy. Um, there, there are not a lot of great Democratic candidates at lower levels uh, who are positioned to move up in a lot of these races. And so you end up grabbing a lot of people who uh, just are willing to throw their names on the ballot and and aren't getting the not getting much financial support, if any. But I think we're beginning to see that change a little bit, and we're seeing it change primarily in Oklahoma County and Tulsa County, and even in Cleveland County. You see uh, a more progressive, young, dynamic candidates being elected to the city councils uh, in those areas, and those are the I hate to call them the minor leagues because it's really important stuff, but you, you, you understand what I'm saying. That's the kind of place where you begin to develop uh, a strong candidate core that then is ready to move into state house and state senate races and then on up into, uh, you know, on up into statewide races. So I, I do think it just takes time probably with these things. And uh, it's, pro it's undoubtedly going to happen in the urban areas first. Uh, the, the rural areas, I, I don't know how Democrats can penetrate um, those areas at all at this point. And, and I, you know, it's, I'm going to stereotype a little bit here, and, and, I, and I don't mean to. I, I think there's a lot of truth in this. But, you know, in, in a lot of rural Oklahoma, folks are glued to Fox News, and they're getting a lot of their political information from their pulpit. And that does not bode well um, when Republicans have been very successful nationalizing races uh, here in Oklahoma. Now, the question was, was posted up here on the chat about the notary requirement. I, I think that did work pretty well. I mean, at least it, it gave people a little bit of, uh, of an option that uh, maybe if you had a printer at home that was, you know, a copy or two or that, that sort of thing, you copy your, your ID. Um, and, but I don't, you know, when you fill out an absentee ballot and send it in, you are signing an affidavit. And so if, you, you know, if you're up to something you know, and you get caught, you know, the book can be thrown at you on this. So I don't really see any reason why we shouldn't just go ahead and drop that entirely. Because it, it is really difficult for people uh, who are, who, you know, are maybe, um, you know, workaday Oklahomans as opposed to more affluent, affluent people to sort of, uh, you know, get some, to, to clear some of those hurdles and get their ballots sent in. So I, we'll see whether or not they're willing to expand it to go ahead and say, all right, you know, it won't just be in terms of a, of a medical emergency. We'll go ahead and, uh, uh, or a state emergency, state declared emergency, but we'll go ahead and, and just throw it open and see what happens. You know, Arnold, I think it's interesting, this whole idea of, you know, these voter restrictions, whether it's voter ID, uh, with, you know, they do some like purging of the, of the uh, voter rolls, things like that. I think it's interesting because they usually charge it's voter fraud. There's voter fraud. It's rampant out there. We got to restrict things and whatnot. Um, and it's fascinating, you know, and I've, I've, I've written a little bit about this, but, um, you know, if you go to, let's say, Heritage Foundation, which, you know, is, is a conservative uh, website, and you look at their voter fraud website, and there's about 1,200 folks they found over the last 20 years who have uh, been convicted or found to have voter fraud, about 1,200. Well, 1,200 out of billions of votes will not carry anything unless they're all concentrated all in one place. But these are all multiple years. So Oklahoma, I looked, had like five uh, mm -hmm. since 2012, five. And that's all, all they list is five. And, and none of them carried any type of election ever. There's no way they could because they're all like one vote here and one vote there. Um, so I think it's very interesting. Another guy actually found um, 31 uh, instances of voter fraud out of billions of votes. Uh, it's it just, I think the voter fraud thing is just an overhyped deal. 
that creates issues because it creates a justification for barriers. So I'm wondering, is there a way, are there other ways to uh, create an easier way for people to uh, vote in this state? I had a, one of my freshman American government students suggested that we use uh, blockchain technology, maybe with a biometric. I know my, my phone, I can get into my pharmacy or my bank with a face ID. So, you know, there's, there's that. I, I do want to ask Jan, and, and it looks like Christine left, darn it. Um, Jan, I don't know, you, you've kind of been involved with uh, getting the, the voter turnout among our uh, college students. And I was wondering, I know this year, you know, we, we split our classes up into uh, these virtual students. And I know our parking lots are, are empty when normally this time of year, they're pretty crowded. I, did you, do we see a big drop in terms of college students? Uh, well, I can tell you just from uh, basic anecdotal evidence, uh, we conduct a voter registration booth for an entire week from nine to three every single day in our college, which is the largest population in terms of uh, foot traffic uh, of any of the colleges at the university. And during the first Obama election, we had a little over 325 new registered voters or people that filled out registration forms. During the second Obama election, we were about 270, 280, somewhere in there. Uh, the Clinton-Trump election, we were surprised. We were only at about 240. Uh, and this election, we were 18. Oh, and Jan had a question. Uh, she says, it will be interesting to see what percentage of OK ballots were by mail. And I haven't seen any of the data yet. Well, I actually did find some of that. Uh, of course, we had about 1.5 million total uh, overall votes. Um, but we had about 200,000 uh, 279,186 total uh, early votes. Uh, Democrats had just slightly more, uh, 46% versus, or is it, uh, yeah, is it distribution? Well, it's 128,000 versus 112,000 for early. Uh, but if you're looking at the, if you're looking at the top of the, Tip at the top of the ballot, which is what you sort of base these things on, yeah. obviously. You're talking about 2% of the votes were absentee ballots, basically. And um, overall, early voting was 444,000, and that's combined like early voting and uh, absentee ballot, uh, ballots. 444,000, which is just tiny, like Arnold said, that's just tiny compared. So we didn't do a whole lot for some reason. Our numbers were very low. And maybe that's one of the reasons why we're 50th in the country in turnout. In terms yeah, of the, the question becomes, what do you do? You know, how do you, if you have not had a culture of civic engagement, which clearly that's the problem here in Oklahoma, you know, how do you, do you have to make that a public policy uh, initiative that we're going to get our folks more engaged than they have been? They're not just going to get one semester of Oklahoma history and they're not just going to get one semester of uh, you know, of, of government uh, in uh, in high school, they're going to get more than that. Well, in high schools, we actually find that there some schools don't like. I have I have students in my American government classes uh, who don't have government in their school. I mean, they've never had a government class. Uh, it's not a huge percentage, but there are students who don't have that. It's like a hit and miss, um, and uh, I think that's an issue. Um, if you go to college, of course, you have to have American government. Thank goodness. Um, thank goodness for, for political science folks, right? Um, but, you know, that's in college and there's only a small percentage who actually go to college. So comparatively overall uh, population. So uh, I think that's an issue. So education is important, but, you know, we need to get to lower grades, like have multiple uh, classes over the years. And I think that would be helpful, which we've gone away from. Any other questions? What, how about early vote or uh, same day registration? What do you guys think about that? That's that can raise uh, anywhere from five to seven percent. They find um, in voting five percent turnout. Well, that would have to go through the Republican legislature, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking that's very slim. Yeah. yeah. To be real honest. 
And I think that's an issue on any of these uh, reforms. Yeah. I, I wonder too, though, if um, there might be a better shot at something like ranked choice voting, mm -hmm. uh, because you can make the argument that that uh, would save the taxpayers money because you wouldn't have runoffs then after that. You'd have instant runoffs uh, in effect. And it may also be more engaging for the voters because they may be choosing between candidates and say, well, you know, I'm having a hard time deciding between these two. I'm going to vote for, you know, slim and, but I'll give, you know, I'll rank none number two and, and, you know, and, and I'm okay with that if none wins, you know, I mean, it's, I, I don't know. It's it, maybe that's an easier path than the, I think that Jan's right. There's a lot of fear about same day registration and what that could mean. Well, is that rank rank uh, choice voting? Is that something that uh, Republicans are could be? I mean, you're talking about saving money, and that would be a way to frame it. I don't know what they think about it at all. I know there's a movement uh, afoot right now mm -hmm. in trying to push uh, rank choice voting uh, on the state level, but I really don't know what people think about it in terms of uh, its legitimacy or not very small movement. And just to emphasize the point about the cost, every time you don't do a statewide election just for a runoff, it's at least $800,000 that costs the state. So um, that's something to think about. I mean, in a particularly in an era of budget crunches that we are probably gonna be experiencing these next couple of years, especially um, $800,000 to run basically on some in some cases a single race across the state because there are two republican candidates for one of the statewide races um does not seem to be the best use of our resources but that's just me that's a great point so yeah the money argument might potentially win the day if it's framed right and to the right audiences well, and we saw, even though it didn't pass, we, we you know, we've seen uh, the left and the right come together on criminal justice reform. And so it seems like this might be another opportunity that's, you know, ripe to, to make that case for different reasons, perhaps. I don't know. But, but I could see both sides saying, yeah, this is a smarter way to go. Any other reform possibilities? So, so yes. you, you guys think we'll mail an absentee ballot to every registered voter? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Uh, just yes. in case you haven't heard, the um, Georgia uh, Senate Purdue race looks like it may go to a runoff. So we may have mm -hmm. two runoffs in the state of Georgia. So uh, it's just fell below 50%. It was at 50.1 and then it just fell below 50%. So if it stays below 50%, it has to go to runoff and that will be held on January 5th. So that makes Georgia a lot more interesting in terms of these remaining 50,000 ballots or so to count in Georgia. So. Is it January the 5th? Why did I think it was in December? Am I, am I, it was that yeah. a previous time? I don't know. I think it's January. That's why I heard January for that runoff. Oh. But are they both around the same time? Or are they, are they going to be on the same runoff ballot in Georgia? Or is that going to be I, different dates? That I don't, I don't know. know. But oh, it's an automatic runoff if it's below 50%, just like us. So even 49.9 would be a runoff. And that's something you could do, too, um, is um, con uh, concentrate the, the voting days. So there's fewer voting days. Um, you know, so local, state, and federal, you know, they're all on the same date as much as possible to consolidate those dates, school board, things like that. I think when you have so many, it's, it gets confusing as to did you vote or not and when to vote. I think that's a non-starter in a lot of communities, though, who, uh, you know, are, are concerned about, they like the system the way it is and where school board elections and school bond issues and some of those things are concerned. So uh, I think that may be one of the the higher hurdles to clear in this process. Well, hey, um, we only have uh, about a minute uh, or two to go. Uh, any last comments? If not, I want to I want to thank uh, Dr. Hart, Jan Hart, uh, Arnold Hamilton, James Davenport uh, for being here today and having a great conversation. 
And uh, so I want to thank you all for that. And our next panel is coming up. That's going to be on state and local politics. Uh, Tony uh, Litherland, Litherland uh, will uh, be the discussant for that. So thank you all. Thank you. Have a good day. See you in a little bit. Thanks for hosting, John. Yeah, thank you.